Thank you. So this is definitely not just my work. This is work that has been done by some of the people that I have on the list here and a lot more people. This work has been done since we started developing or having the issue in Oregon in 2009. So we've been working on Drosophila suzukii since 2009 now. Um, uh, we have spent multiple tens of millions of dollars on this issue. Um, it causes around $720 million loss, crop loss, in the United States alone. On the West Coast, we're looking at uh, around uh, $500 million lost um, initially uh, on this insect pest. Um, and then in Oregon, we're looking at uh, around 10% initially uh, losses of revenue because of this insect. So let's look at, at uh, something slightly different. Uh, one thing that we know is that in our industries, usually when it goes well, there's always this nagging feeling that something's going to happen, and that's exactly what happened to us. It's this, this change. We were making a lot of money, and uh, our prices were good, and suddenly a problem arrived. So I'm going to show you uh, a slide that is totally unrelated to flies, except for one thing. Anyone willing to give me or make a comment about this painting? Anyone here interested in making a comment as to what they see in this painting here? My dad always would say for me, to me, what is the, um, uh, what is the significance of, of something? Is there some symbolism here? Anyone willing to make a comment? This is, go ahead, you. It's got a bug on its head. Uh, the, this wonderful headdress, this beautiful headdress. We've got a woman. This is a painting that was um, uh, painted around 600 years ago. And so back in those days, if you were rich, you'd have yourself painted. Obviously, this person is in the prime of their life, very rich. Look at the jewelry. Look at the headdress. But things are going to change. We're never in that moment again, right? It's the same as in our industries itself as well. And so uh, when we look at this woman, um, what we're learning, the symbolism that I get out of this, and maybe I'm different than the art historians, and we won't talk about art too much any further, but um, the symbolism that I see in this fly is that, generally speaking, as Matthew was saying a little bit earlier, these insects have extremely quick life cycles. So that just like this woman looks as if she would live forever and be in her prime forever, her life is basically like that of a fly. It'll be over pretty quickly. The moment of glory will be op over very quickly. Um, now, um, I'm not going to be um, sharing a doom and gloom talk today. The, the, the lighter side of things are, um, you know... Dependent on your political affiliation, this is good news because whoever our president is in the United States, they're not going to be around forever. You know, they, they will pass. Uh, uh, the time of difficulty will pass, and we will we will have our next president, right? So here you have your fly, and so there you can see the ovipositor real clearly, ovipositing in a berry, and this is slowed down. The first one was sped up. This one's slowed down. There you can see the egg on the uh, laid in the berry. So if we do this in a schematic way, um, we have our adult flies. They have the saw-like ovipositor. They will deposit the egg directly under the surface of the, of the berry. Those larvae will develop inside the berry, and eventually they'll pupate outside of the berry. This whole life cycle under ideal conditions will can be as fast as seven days. So one of your five or seven um, characteristics of high adaptability, Matthew. Our growers were harvesting our fruit in 2009. They would ship it to our markets, with, and if they did not do cold storage, they would have these, these fallen-in berries, totally unmarketable. Significant issue. So how do we deal with this problem um, when it, it not only affects just one crop, but multiple crops. And so here you can see the crops um, in order of preference by this insect. We're starting down there with wine grape, peach, blueberry, cherry, blackberry, strawberry, and raspberry. 
And this is directly related to fruit softness, to sugar levels. Um, you can find this article online. If you take a photo of that or write it down, EM9264, that information is available online for free, real useful information. Also she talks about bricks and it talks about other characteristics. So this is our new, new reality. 2010, this is our new reality in Oregon. Growers went ahead, spent $150,000 on new sprayers. As the crop ripens, they'd be spraying their fields for 24 hours a day to get through the acreage. They're spraying two to three times per week. They're spraying 20 times per season. Not the most sustainable of situations. Let's look at the life cycle of this insect and look at the life stages and the population structure. So what I want you to look at here, on the left hand side, we're looking at population structure. Remember we're from the northern hemisphere, so June, July, this would be midsummer. So what I see from that graph, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, you see that little sliver of yellowish green right at the top. That's your adult life stage right there. You're going out with that massive sprayer. You're spraying 20 times. You're spraying and the pesticide breaks down. And the next life stage, the, the pupa comes out. And you have these waves and waves of population emerging after you've sprayed your pesticide. Look at the temperatures here. Anything about, above 32 degrees centigrade on average, I'm not talking about maximum temperature of the day, 32 degrees centigrade on average, suboptimal, temperatures below 10 to 14, suboptimal. Pretty clear that South Africa is a very, very suitable climate. World distribution. Many of you may have seen this figure. This is done by Dos Santes, 2017. Started in Western United States, in Oregon, California, 2009. Spread to Eastern, over the Rockies, over the Cascades, over the Sierras, over the Mississippi, over the big, the big um, uh, uh, prairies, to the East Coast, down Central America, into Mexico, across um, the desert there in Peru, down to uh, Chile, into Brazil, into the very southern portions of Brazil. It went into, it's now found all over Europe. We know it's an issue in Morocco. Now we know it's an issue in South Africa. Our issue, if we look at the west coast there, you look at the sliver of red on the west coast there of, of, of the United States, looks like nothing, right? It's much more than nothing. This is where around 80% of our fruit in the United States is produced on the West Coast. Look at South Africa there. All the red areas is where we're producing our fruit. So it's here, and it's not going to go away. How do we deal with it? We're dealing with it mostly by pesticides. We're spraying pesticides. There are some clever scientists that are doing, doing gene splicing, some irradiation. We're doing trapping and monitoring. We're doing IPM, as was shown to us much earlier. Um, we're using parasitoids. We had students go to Korea and China, Yunnan province, bring in some new parasitoids. But mostly still, to this very day, we're using insecticides to deal with this problem. I apologize for this extremely busy slide here. The only reason why I'm having this slide here is because um, it, is a, it is a problem that needs to be attacked, that needs to be dealt with in a systemic way. We're using chemicals, it's not sustainable. We're having issues with secondary insect pests now. We're pruning our berries, we're putting weed fabric, we're putting drip irrigation, we, we're putting netting, we're, putting, um, uh, we're cleaning our fruit from the ground, we're doing sanitation, we are um, releasing natural enemies, and we are doing post-harvest treatments very effectively. 
That's basically what management looks like here in the United States now. Let's look at the pesticides, and I'm not going to be talking about pesticides. Color, color codes here, you can find this um, document online at the OSU website, uh, EM9360. We have about 20 pesticides around that. And so where you see the dotted line, that's kind of the acceptable level of control that we're getting. And so generally speaking, what our growers are doing through the season, I'm not going to show those slides uh, now, is they're using the harder compounds earlier in the season. So they're, they're spraying it, they know that it's persistent, and they know there will be no MRLs associated. Our growers had shipped perfect fruit to Asia. Why did they get rejected? MRLs. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars dealing with MRLs, trying to figure that out. What our growers are now doing is they're applying the harsher compounds earlier. What our modeling data have shown is that when you're doing your comp compounds, the harsher compounds er earlier, and we have really bad stuff, things like lamate, good stuff, but also bad stuff. Our growers do not hesitate using those phosphate. Um, zeta cypermethrin, compounds like that, bifenthrin. And then late in the season where you see that dotted line, the red in the middle, spinosad, spinetaram, that's what they use just before harvest. We've got literally hours of um, pre-harvest interval when we're using those compounds. Okay. Enough doom and gloom. Let's use our brains just a little bit. I had a professor here at Stellenbosch University when I was studying at Stellenbosch University. And we were always talking, and we'd go up to Kutzenberg and, and we'd look at the plants there and he'd say to me, so why do these plants not look as if they've been fed on by insects? And here we have a perfect example of that. Plants have evolved and have, um, have been attacked by insects for millions of years. Here we have a beautiful example of trichomes of a plant protecting the plant against feeding um, of this aphid. So there's one example of plants um, that can be, or structures of plants that can be used to defend against the insects. So let's use those, those basic principles to our benefit. Let's try, up, try and come up with a solution to the problem. And so this is one of the solutions of the problem. Anyone here know what this is? Anyone willing to make a guess as to what this is? What are we looking at over here? I hear something starting with an S. It's seeds. Yeah, we're seeing seeds here. These are seeds. But what are we seeing when we look at these seeds? Every single one of them, they're very unique. It's a beautiful photo. But there's something on each of these seeds that's kind of the same. Look at the one at the middle of there. Look at the one at the middle towards the right-hand side on that photo. See that little yellow pod right there? You know what that is? That's what's called an eliosome. What does an eliosome do? It is the way of the plant, and, and, and the classical example that we talk about very often is ants here in the Feinbos biome. Um, Ants will collect those seeds because those eliosomes produce a volatile. And so because the soils are so poor, the um, seed cannot produce this massive fatty tissue. So it's creating a tiny little bit, just enough to attract the ant. Ant collects it, takes it into the soil, and this, eats it, and the seed, um, the seed then germinates. So it's kind of a mutualistic relationship here. We're using this exact same principle also for Drosophila suzukii. We want to send to the insect the signal, there's something here that's worthwhile for you to feed on. So this is kind of the light uh, at the end of the tunnel um, uh, slide that I'm going to show next year. This is a technology 
that we developed at OSU, and you know, this is a technology that, that I ended up buying from OSU, and, and now it's licensed to the Driscoll Group, and it's, it's going to be distributed all over the world. Just wanted to be clear about that. Um, this is a technology where if you look at the bottom left-hand photo there, you can see these adult flies sitting on that little dispenser there. What does this do? It sends that exact same signal to this insect that there's something here that is worth it for you to stay here and not go to the fruit. And that's exactly what we were finding. And this is a beautiful figure that I'm showing here. Some of it looks terrible. The, some of the other slides in other f plots don't look quite as nice as this. I'd like, to, I'd like to just be clear on that. But what it does is when you look at the grower standard, GS, so you look there at the yellow. That is the, um, that is the, uh, the eggs, eggs laid per fruit. And these numbers are low. When you compare that with your um, gum, in this case, that we used, it is statistically slightly different. But when you're harvesting your fruit and you're selling it to the, to the or taking it to the packing house, absolutely no difference. Absolutely no difference. This is a niche technology. This is a technology that is used by, you know, industrial, industrial horticultural crops. It's not something that's necessarily going to be used here. So where do we go to then um, in future? How do we reduce our pesticide dependence? One of the technologies that, that, are, that, that you guys are already using here is for Mediterranean fruit fly. You guys are using, and this is common sense, bait sprays. This is what our growers in the Dells have been telling us for 10 years. We want bait sprays. We want GF120 back. Because they were dealing with western cherry fruit fly and cherries in the Dells by using GF120. The reason why they want that, very low labor cost, very low residues. Bait spray on the left-hand side, low volume, low active ingredient, Quick coverage, very low quantity of coverage on the berry as opposed to the full cover application. I'm going to show you one more data slide. This is lab data. I didn't have time. We have two minutes left here. No time to share the field data with you. The lab data always looks better. Okay, left-hand side, untreated control. Now we're looking at eggs laid per berry. This is an arena. You have your, um, our technology that we developed at OSU. We have our Combi Protect. There was an earlier speaker who was saying, you know, what is good enough for a biopesticide? This is a biopesticide. We're getting our growers are telling us they're saving anything between 50 and 75% of their crop. If you're adding a toxicant to that attractant, right-hand graph there, untreated control, low, low mortality, you don't want that. You look at our technology, the OSU technology, and then Combi Protect, under mud product. You do have under mud in uh, South Africa. It's a product that might be available, come available here in South Africa. I think this is, this is what we need to do here in South Africa. We need to skip the line. We need to learn from the tens of millions of dollars that our Americans have been spending on it. Don't spend that money. Work on te technologies like these. Work on parasitoids. These guys are clever here at Stellenbosch University. They know exactly how to deal with the problem. One last slide. I have a Qualtrics code there. If you're, if you're willing to click on that, um, take a photo of that. Survey is less than 30 seconds. If you look at that, um, I will be able to tell my deans, yes, the South Africans think that my slide, my, I helped them or no, um, so I need, I need to improve, so you can do that, it, it, it's active, I was just looking at it very recently. Guaranteed continuous change, we know that that's going to happen. We know how to manage it. We know we need to use integrated control. I think the future here in South Africa, our guys know how to do that area-wide, we know how to do attract and kill, I think it has tremendous problems. You know, you're never prepared, but I think here in South Africa, it looks to me as if people are ready for it. Um, 
And the bottom line here is you will be able to continue producing high quality fruit. Just make sure you don't get caught out with your MRLs. It's possible. Okay, and I think that's it. Thank you.